Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to not only plants that seed of faith in our hearts, but brings the blessing of Jesus' work to us. Strengthening of faith, the forgiveness of sins, and life and salvation. Lord, create in us a clean heart. Renew an unwavering spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, It's part of the human way of thinking. It's part of the sinful nature to want to fashion God to our way of thinking, to make him into one of us, or to try, maybe in our struggle to comprehend him, to make him something that he isn't. So many times Jesus, in the mind of the believer, the different believers, is made into something that is completely ungodly, completely unbiblical. Let me give you one example, and there are many, but just this morning I'd like to focus on just one. And it's made, trying to make Jesus into what one would call a, 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 a friend who accepts anything, okay? We like to think of, or our sinful nature likes to think of the Lord as one who doesn't call out sin. He doesn't want anybody to feel bad. And so therefore, if I'm doing something or if somebody else is doing something, we try to make Jesus as one who's going to ignore it. One who's going to sweep it under the carpet. And maybe even in some instances, praise us for it. Praise us for our bravery. Praise us for being different and being a different cut from the mold. But that is not the Jesus that Scripture reveals. That is not who God is. Because if that's who God is, if that's who our Savior is, we're only destined for one place. And that place is hell. And there are even people like to think that Jesus never taught about hell. That a loving Savior would never ever say somebody is going to go there. But that's not who Jesus is. You know, if that's who we think God is, it's going to have an effect on how we live and what we do and how we look at sin. We'll take pride in our sin. We'll rationalize it. We'll do it more and more, and the wedge between us and our Holy Heavenly Father becomes wider and wider and wider. Thankfully, that is not how King David felt. King David is the man who wrote the words of Psalm 51. The, 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 the whole song, we're focusing on the second half, in our text for Pentecost Sunday today. There are words that are familiar. We sing them very often in, uh, in many of our worship services. The words of the created me, the operatory. <coughs> Excuse me. The words we hear that begin like a, uh, the Matthew service and the Vesper services that we often use. Oh Lord, <coughs> don't know where those are coming from. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. These words are words of repentance. These words are words of sorrow 
and of grief. Because we're told at the beginning of Psalm 51, in the heading that was inspired in Holy Scripture, that this psalm was written by David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. David was never a perfect man. He was never sinless. He was never holy. But he was called a man after God's own heart. And this man had committed some grievous sin. This king, this leader of God's people, not only the leader of the nation, the spiritual leader of his people fell into the sin of adultery. He committed adultery with another man's wife, and then when he discovered that she was pregnant with his child, tried to cover it up. And when that cover-up didn't work, he had her husband murdered in battle. David went along for a whole year. In fact, after her husband died, he immediately brought her into the palace, got married to her, and lived for months like nothing had ever happened. No sorrow, no grief, but everything that he did was okay. Wandering farther and farther away from the Lord, and then the Lord sent his prophet Nathan. Nathan confronted David with his sin, and when David was confronted with his sin, he was struck with horror, with grief. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan spoke those beautiful words of forgiveness. Do not be afraid. You're not going to die. The Lord has taken away your sin. But David had struggled with the guilt of his sin for much of his life. And we see that in the words of Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew an unwavering spirit within me. David knew that God had to make some, create something in him that David could not bring upon himself. And in the heart of any believer, it's the Lord, the Holy Spirit, who brings us to faith who keeps us in faith. He's the one who molds and shapes our heart. When David says, create in me a clean heart, O God, that word create is the same word that was used in Genesis chapter 1 when it said, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God created this universe out of nothing. When God creates in you and me, the believer, a clean heart, when he creates faith in our heart, that is not something that, that, that there's not anything good there. There is nothing. It means that there's nothing that I can do, you can do to draw closer to God. He has to come to us. He has to create faith. He has to create a clean heart. That's what David recognized. That God creates a marvelous change within us. A heart that rejoices. He not only creates the faith that's in us, but he brings us that forgiveness. It was something that David so desperately desired as he struggled with the guilt of his sin. But the words, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven, brought joy to his heart. He knew what it was like to try to carry that burden of sin. He knew what the consequences were had the Lord not intervened. He knew that his sin separated him from God. And then besides dealing with the guilt, I did what I, did what I, I knew was wrong, what was abhorrent, and I thumbed my nose at the Lord. He repented, and the Lord forgave him. That is the joy of salvation. The joy of an unburdened heart. That joy of forgiveness, that joy that only a Christian can understand. And it comes through the working of God's Holy Spirit who creates in us a new heart through the power of his word and through the sacraments. It's also a creative force, a powerful force that the Holy Spirit uses to create a heart that moves me to declare. Listen to David's words again. As he goes on, he says, 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I will teach rebels your ways, and sinners will turn to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, the God who saves me. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. David, because he had been forgiven, he had to declare that too. You know, David sinned many times. It's easy for us to think it was done in secret. For a while it was done. But very often when we think that the only that we're the only ones that know the depths of our sinful heart, or when we often think that we're our sin is in private, no one else, no one else sees it, that's really the blindness of sin. So often people know what's going on. Our secrecy isn't as secret as we like to believe. And that's the way it was with David. He thought that for, for a long time with his sin with Bathsheba, nobody knew what was going on. But his temple guards did. The gossip started and went around town. When she became pregnant, everybody around the palace in the capital of Jerusalem knew who, that, who the father of that child was because her husband was out in battle. The jaws were flapping, and David's sin was, whole, was really mocking God. His sin was public. His sin had a detrimental effect on other people around him. It caused them to maybe chuckle under their breath at God, chuckle under their breath at God's leader. That sin was public. And so David and his forgiveness and his repentance also knew that that was something that for believers is going to be public too. No greater praise can be given to God than from one who has been forgiven. Okay? When you and I, when we realize the power of what God's Holy Spirit has done in our hearts, not only through faith, but bringing that forgiveness that Jesus won for us on the cross, can't help but to speak that, to share that forgiveness with others, or be ready for an answer when someone asks us why we're here, why we belong to a church, why we call ourselves Christian. It's because of that forgiveness of sins which we so desperately need and our Lord has so graciously given us. Some of you may have been here a few weeks ago when we had a man by the name of Chris Dreifach, a Christian singer. I was here and, and performed a, a little concert. Um, Chris has, is a Lutheran. He goes around to different churches across the country. But he's a man who wasn't, uh, who wasn't, hasn't been a Christian his whole life. A convert later on. A man who was an atheist for most of his life. A man who let this, told, who told us that really his life should have ended him up in prison. But rather it brought him to the Lord. And to listen to that man and his music and as he shared his faith with us, you could see and hear that joy of salvation that came from his Savior. And he just loves to tell others about that as well. And it's something that leads us as God's people as a heart to worship him too. The end of our text, David says, Lord, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I can give it. Do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and crushed heart, O God, you will not despise. David knew what really counted with the Lord. It wasn't just something, it's not lip service. It's not going through the motions. David realized that the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices he brought to the temple, could not pay for one sin of anyone. But he knew that the blood of the Savior that was to come would take away his sins and the sins of the whole world. That's what moved him to worship, to hold up his Lord before others. It's what moved him also to pray for his fellow Christians, not only himself, but his fellow Christians, and to be concerned about their spiritual well-being as well as his. In the last verses of our text, David says, As it pleases you, do good for Zion. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with righteous sacrifices, burnt offerings, and whole offerings. David realized 
the consequences of his sins, what it did to others, what it did to God's reputation. And in his worship and in his life, he prays to the Lord for strength to live a life of faith, to live a life that reflected the love of the Savior so that his Savior would be seen rather than his sins. He knew that he was an example. He knew that he was a leader. He prayed that God would use him as the clay instruments that all of us are to still carry out his purpose. God, indeed, as he works through the Holy Spirit, works some wonderful changes in us. You might have heard me say this before, but I've had, I, I was teaching a Bible class years and years ago and had one of, uh, one of my members who was a former Baptist say to me, Pastor, why doesn't the Lutheran Church talk about the Holy Spirit? Why, don't we, why doesn't the Lutheran Church put as much emphasis on him as other denominations do? And I said, that's what you really think? And she said, oh yes. And I said to her, well, how does the Holy Spirit work? How does the Bible tell us the Holy Spirit works? And this lady says, well, Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit does God's work through the proclaiming of the word and through the administering of the sacraments. And I said to her, what does the Lutheran Church do? And she says, well, we preach God's word, we baptize, and we administer Holy Communion. And I said, so what's the problem? How does the Holy Spirit work? And she goes, I get it. Now I get it. That is how God works and brings his blessing in your life and mine. That's how he brings us that wealth of salvation that was worked by our Savior Jesus and puts it in our hands and in our hearts. He takes us who were nothing, who were dead in our trespasses and sins. And through the power of his word, through the power of his sacraments, he brings us from death to life. That is what we celebrate today on this day of Pentecost, that work of the Holy Spirit. Because without him, we would not be with Christ. Without him, there would, we would not be have faith. We would be in heaven. He works powerfully in our lives. May we never take his tools for granted. Baptism, communion, preaching in his word. May we always regard it as holy. And gladly hear it. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. You can find them on page 12 and 13 in the bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the collection of the offering. 